tonight on the Goblin's Corner. Artifacts. That's how we roll. 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 Welcome to the Goblin's Corner. My name is Eric. And I'm Matt. And tonight? We're doing artifacts, man. Exactly. Artifacts, the wondrous abilities of massive amounts of magic or clerical abilities or what have you. Sure. Condensed into an object form. High, high end magic items. Yeah, for your game. Yeah. And so we're going to show you guys A, how to make some, non specifically how to make some. Right. And then give you some thematics behind that, as we always do. Sure. And in addition to that, some examples that we came up with. Yeah. But before we get to that, got a question of the week, man. All the time. Here we go. You ready? What do we have tonight? All right, man. We got a... Is it artifact-based? It is. Ah. I I try to keep them on theme. I really do. Sometimes it just doesn't work out. Here we go. You. Me. Personally. Eric. Yes. You've been granted the power to make a personal artifact. Anything at all. Yep. What form does it take, and what is the theme for the powers? So the obvious answer is a figurine of wondrous power, Godzilla. Fair. Fair. That, yeah. that, that's, that would be my go-to for that, because right. that would be an artifact-level figurine of wondrous power. Sure. Summon kaiju. Yeah. It's just like a better form of the Tarrasque. My Dark Lord Master just rises above. He starts at, he starts at like this big. Yeah, he'd be like this big, too, right? Yeah. He'd be T-tiny. And then he would just all of a sudden sprout out of a house and begin to just stomp the everlasting <laughs> out of everything in its path. Yeah. And why not? But that's too easy. Okay. It really is. So what I would do is, now I've already done the key to the city with the crowbar. Sure. I can't do that again. So what I'm going to say is, I would do sunglasses, artifact sunglasses. Okay. For better hallway vision. You can't can't be blinded. I'm assuming that's got to be be one of the powers. Exactly. Yeah. And true seeing in any hallway, but only in a hallway. Okay. So if you're out in the open, you're screwed. Do caves count? Caves would count. Okay. I would say. Yeah. Because this is a hallway. Sure. Any type of object with that. And we could probably throw some other abilities in there as well. Laser eyes might be useful. Anything that, that sunglasses would particularly have. The ability to recognize any undead, even if disguised. Yes. Mirrors <laughs> behind you, so you could look behind you. Yeah, sure. The ability to see... Uh, Gives you the alertness feet. The alertness feet. The corporate masters as their original guys, as in, uh, what was that movie? Um, They Live. They Live, yeah, absolutely. That's what I was talking about with the undead also. Yeah, Roddy Roddy Piper, man. That was a great movie. Uh, So anything that sunglasses normally could do, protect your eyes as well. Sure. And that's it. They'd just be super protective, awesome sunglasses. Maybe some spy stuff going on as well. Sure. Take some uh, pictures. Do they have a downside? I mean, they don't have to. The downside is, is that you don't look cool wearing them, ever. <laughs> that would be, like, no matter how cool you are, you never look good wearing them. You look like a complete dork. Gotcha. And that would be my uh, my artifact. Okay. What would your artifact be if you were to choose? Personal artifact, and what form does it take in theme? Well, in, in the same uh, issue that you have, a la the key to the city, I've already used a coffee cup. Yep. So we've already done our two favorite things right breaking things and coffee right so that's godzilla and godzilla and godzilla every time so that makes it a little difficult for me i'm i'm tempted to go on theme with the coffee cup though Hmm. and say a campfire percolator that would be nice i'm going to challenge you artifact dice that would be awesome I could do that. Like a a set of artifact dice. A set of artifact dice. And each die does a different thing. The D4 is obviously going to have to do something in line with like a spike growth or a call drop. Physical damage, yeah. Yeah, When you step on that thing, it's going to hurt. Straight to your soul, man. Oh my God. That was an incidental pun. D6 does backstab damage of some sort. It'd be only fitting. Or fireball damage. Or fireball yeah, damage. So oh, yeah. I forgot about that. What would the D8s do? Uh, uh, oh, you know what the D6 does? On each face of the D6, 
is a damage type. Hmm. And it allows you to adjust your damage type. I could totally see that. Regardless of what weapon or spell you're using. You literally just, as a bonus action, every round you can change up your damage dice, your damage type. Only gives you six options, though. Oh. Oh, too bad. Oh, so sad. Um, the D8? What does the D8 do? Uh, a healing pool. A certain number of D8s worth of healing throughout the day. Okay. Because D8s are primarily used for cure spells and harm. D10s? Um, temporary hit points? Could be. Could S- be. Successes, if you're playing like a D10 system. Yeah. Uh, could be a number of martial maneuvers per day. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, I like that. The D20. Oh, oh D12. D12, D12. D12. Rages? Yeah. Do you want to do rages? I mean, that's kind of the given. If this weren't set specifically for D&D, then what else would a D12 do? Now, it is the damage die for some large weapons. So maybe a wallop would be kind of cool? Yeah. And then D20s would be? You, you swing, you roll your D12, and if every time you roll a 12, then your weapon swells to a larger size, and you automatically deal extra damage with it. I'm buying it. So what would the D20 do? The D20, I'm going to say four times a day, anytime you make a roll or someone else makes a roll, friend or enemy, Mm -hmm. you can roll at the same time as them and choose which role they have to take. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So I it like could that. be advantage for yourself or a friend or disadvantage for an enemy. You just, you roll at the same time they do and just. You got a name for it? Because I have an amusing one, but I'd like to hear what you have for this artifact dice set. I don't know. What would you call it? I mean, you could call it the, the dice of the math rocks god <laughs> or anything, really. I had something, then I forgot it. Yeah. That's how, that's how it works, guys. Sometimes we come up with stuff, sometimes we don't. Do you collect dice? Or perhaps you're listening to the wrong podcast. Write to us, info at goblinscorner.com, or you can reach me, eric at goblinscorner.com, or me, Matt, at goblinscorner.com. And of course, you can find us on all the things. So many things. Such as the podcast you're currently listening to right now. Or video you're watching. If you or have video, to be watching you're watching. It's also considered a podcast. How about oh, that? that's true. Yeah, yeah, they don't call it a video cast. We haven't gone into the future just yet. Vidcasting. Vidcasting, bro. Vlogging. Tridio, if chummer. That'd be <laughs> kind of a wish. God, sign me up for some fireballs and urban renewal. All right. So let's talk a little bit about artifacts tonight. Ah, I figured it out. You finally got a name? Yep. What? Neil Boggs Click Clacks. Click Clacks. Neil Boggs Click Clacks. Because remember, Neil Bog was the, uh, the goblin god of trickery who was the only god that Mugly Biuk didn't successfully murder because he kind of just dispersed himself throughout the uh, the goblin tribes. That's called a deep cut, guys. He just dredged oh. that from his memory banks. Yeah, <laughs> very good. It's like a I I see your brain working like a long like a fishing trawler. Yeah, You're just it's, dragging a net behind it. Very cool. That's probably fair. Yeah. So, so let's let's talk about artifacts now. All right. So first off. Uh, let's, it would be, for the purposes of this podcast, let's define what we're going to consider an artifact is tonight. Okay. So an artifact is most often a magic item that is often divine in nature or created by very powerful magics mm-hmm. that has a suite of powers that are often themed either to use in, in the way that like a, a healing staff has a suite of healing themes yep or themed off of the person that created it very good very powerful created by somebody usually themed yep sometimes amusing guys deck of many things uh, yeah deck of many things. a perfect example of that <laughs> yes uh in addition it could be an object made by some sort of sentient creature of any type now in our human in our world it's human right but in a ttrpg it can be anything that thinks and sometimes things that don't think if it's you, powerful enough if it's powerful enough now, it also can be a object of typical cultural or historical interest. It's true. And in fact, 
they kind of go hand in hand, right? The more historical or the more history an, an artifact has, the more likelihood it might be powerful as well. Right. And what you will find is when we start getting to the artifacts that we've created for tonight, they're going to have some lore to them. If they don't, it's be only because it's lost to history. Sure. And it's for the storyteller to create. Right. So what makes an artifact? Firstly, power. Yeah, right. It's got to be powerful. There's no such thing as an artifact wand of magic missiles. Like yep. that's, that doesn't cut it. No, it's got to be something, you know, wand of magic missiles is nice, but a, but a bazooka of magic missiles is better. Sure. A Gatling gun of magic missiles. A Gatling gun of magic missiles certainly is some sort of artifact. Secondly, they're difficult to destroy and they can, that can usually only be accomplished by, by very specific sets of conditions. scenarios, conditions, yeah. yeah. You can't just use a disjunction on something like that. you got to throw it into Mount Doom. You have to go through an entire trial. Yeah, with Mount it. Doom being the perfect example of that. Sure. Toss it into the sun, something has yeah. to happen. Thirdly, they're literally legendary objects. Yeah. And we mentioned it. historical significance. These are of legend, which means even... The common everyday people outside of the field of expertise may have heard of this object, like the Rod of Seven Parts. Yes. Or, you know, the One Ring. Sure. They're going to hear about it. And as a result of that, some, these items simply exist due to their longevity and power. So they exist in the cultural collectiveness. Right. Yeah. Like you said, like the Rod of Seven Parts, that, that has existed for long enough and it's well enough known that even non-bards and non-mages are aware of its ex existence. Or um, Elminster's pipe. If you see a pipe that's floating and it's smoking itself, it's probably Elminster's, so don't smoke it. Yes. Because he's probably invisible and laughing at you. You can always ask, though. You could ask, yeah. I mean, you know, puff, puff, give, baby. And fourthly, they are unique to the world. Or at the very least, there's a finite number of them. This keeps them from being run-of-the-mill Magic Mart type items. Uh, as well as having specificity for stories. Yeah, and that falls into the realm of the DM. So, because they're unique to the world, you're not going to just find them anywhere. As we mentioned, they're legendary before, right? Right. And so they have a story behind them. So, if you're going to find the One Ring, it's called the One Ring because there's only one ring. Right. Also, you will find that. In Lord of the Rings, in a Middle Earth setting. Yep. You're not going to find that on Forgotten Realms. You're not going to find King Calix crown. Now, if you're in Greyhawk, you might find the hand and eye of Vecna. Sure. Although, the, now that Vecna is a deity, he can, can be, be found in... Yeah, it's all over the place yep. now. So... Yay. They, <laughs> you know, all you got to do is lop your hand off and pull out your eye, and you could be rocking those things, too. Think about all of that, because what we're getting at is, is that all artifacts have a story, even if the lack of a story, that means that there's still a story behind it. It just means that the characters don't know. So you can invent an artifact for your game sure, without any story whatsoever. You could basically just say, the story is unknown. It exists in legend. Only a couple of things are known, like these three or four things, bullet points. Then they can go on a quest to figure out what that story is. And maybe they heard wrong because over time the story has been corrupted or lost. How fun is that? Plus, as a storyteller, gives you an out. Sure. Lots of time to go write the story on the back end. Or, if you're smart and savvy like we are, have the players write the story for you. Sure. Because as they're playing, they go, well, maybe it's blah, blah, blah. That sounds pretty good. I'm going to write that down. Yeah, it is like that. Good job. That was my... <laughs> That's exactly what I do sometimes. Sure. Uh, one of the things I like about, art if it is a common artifact, unless mm -hmm. you're in a homebrew world, you should assume that there it has some common knowledge amongst the greater population. Yes. If it is a homebrew artifact in any world, then maybe it's been buried for literally thousands of years and it has left the collective consciousness. And if your players want to find out about it, then they're going to have to go to writings that are old enough to remember its existence or to 
creatures or people that are old enough to remember its existence. All of this sounds like a quest, guys. Yep. Got to save the world, got to learn about the artifact. Or maybe the, the artifact is what's destroying the world, so to save the world, you have to defeat the artifact. Yeah. Never, never know. So we have some details regarding artifacts. They are uh, of the following qualifications. And you can add or subtract more if you like, but these are what we've generally found artifacts to be. First off, they're usually superior in craftsmanship. They may not look it, but right. they're well-made because sure. they're hard to destroy. <laughs> they oftentimes contain very powerful spells. Yeah, lots of powerful magic. They might give you increased damage, agility, or uh, some kind of ability modif modifier skill checks as well. Yep. So any type of like physical or skill-based attribute might beef it up or give you a detriment. Sure. They very often convey at will minor abilities or magic. Absolutely. Usually minor, but not always. Not always. Sometimes get a wish occasionally. Or, you know, if uh, the very first primal fire elemental created a orb of solid flame it would not be out of the realms of possibility that you could just keep chucking fireball i mean what else is it good for at that point except well roasting things yes and looking really awesome they also would contain either major or minor beneficial properties sometimes yep. they don't have to but we found that a lot of times most artifacts do sure they also, as before stated, can contain major or minor detrimental properties. And it also should be noted that curses often fall within the realm of having an artifact as well. Not always. Some of them don't. But some of them have very awful curses. Yes. And some of them are cursed in multiple ways. Mm -hmm. So, you know, oftentimes you can't put it down, right? That's, that's a pretty common one. But when you consider the fact that you now hold a unique object of power in your possession, <laughs> if anyone finds out about that, you are target numero uno for anyone seeking power. Sure. Get the big bad gun now. Mess people up. It should also be noted that many of these artifacts might have specific requirements behind them as well. Sure. So you might have to be a specific alignment or a species of some sort or have to like a particular deity or you have to be, I don't know, you have to be a lover of fine wine. You know, whatever those qualifications have to be. I mean, you that might, would make sense for Dionysus. Sure. You might take damage if you're not. Again, one of the detriments behind this. And it might leave if the wrong person attempts to use it. And it could be intelligent and take you over. Yes. Steal your soul or summon a demon. So, it, Or just possess you. Yeah. They're, they're basically dangerous abilities, regardless. All artifacts tend to have some sort of flavor of danger to them. So what we're saying behind all of this is use these to flavor your artifact and build that. Bonuses are great, but they're better if there's a story behind them. Absolutely. All right, so you've got a basic idea of an artifact. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to run a game with an artifact? The first thing you have to consider is artifacts by their nature are often something that an entire campaign can be centered around. It doesn't have to be the only thing it's centered around, but it is going to be one of the very central uh, tenets of the campaign. Correct. And the way that, as we mentioned before, Lord of the Rings was literally based around destroying the One Ring. Yeah, they've got a level of power and depth and history. And so it generally means that if, you know, if something is in play in your game, it's going to be that central focus. People find the hand and eye of Vecna. Guess what? There's going to be a quest around that because you don't want someone to have that. Yes. Or what is it? The, uh, the Crown of Bone or whatever that Merkel had? Uh, Crown of Horns. Crown of Horns. Yeah. yeah. That was that really sucked as well. Yeah. Just ask Laryl. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so there's a couple of options in terms of stories and running with artifacts. We've got a couple examples here. So what's what's one of those examples? I mean, the first one, the search for the artifact, right? Gotta, Gotta find, find it. it. <laughs> yeah. What's the reason behind I'm finding it? Figure it out. Yeah. 
sent by a church, sent by an archmage, sent by a patron, sent by whoever, or just found a map. Yeah, or found the artifact yeah. or a piece of it, and you got to put it together. Brought a seven parts. There you go. Protecting an artifact or hiding an artifact from some other creature is always a fun one. So you're either protecting it from the bad guys or even the good guys to get it, or hiding it because you can't destroy it, so you have to like get it locked behind something like non-detection, but it's trying to call out. It wants to be used. Oftentimes, artifacts have built-in non-detection, unless it's something that is smart enough to call, to want to be used. Yep. Uh, another one is simply destroying an artifact. Simply. Yeah, okay. One does not simply destroy an artifact. <laughs> another, one does not simply walk into Mount Doom, <laughs> toss the ring in, and expect it to just melt away. Well, actually, yeah, it's they a could volcano. Have if they had just flown. Yeah, um, they, they really could have just used the eagles. I mean, but, or a balloon, something, man, gliders. If, it, if you, you need something fast because the, the Nazguls were still out and about. Oh, so. yeah. Wrangle a Nazgul, man. Come on. Get a, co- get a cowboy out there. Come on. Ha. Be great. <laughs> but yeah, so destroying an artifact or finding some way to lock it away is yes. another option. Um, another option is you could rescue the artifact from someone or something that your group or organization believes shouldn't control. Rescue. Yeah. Rescuing could mean acquiring it for your own purposes. Sure. I mean, no matter what, you're stealing it. Yeah. Absolutely. You mean you might be stealing it for the greater good, but you are stealing it. Well, I mean, it could be, you know, belongs in a museum. Sure. So you want to get that artifact back. Uh, Maybe you're on a quest or having a campaign based around founding or creating a new artifact. That would be cool. So you could be epic level or even just regular level. Yeah. Maybe just the story is epic enough that the storyteller is like, hey, I'm going to make an artifact out of this. That's how the uh, the fire rats came about. That's how the bicycle built for 12 came about. It's not an artifact, but could be. Sure. If you don't know what we're talking about, go see our Magic Items episode. So think of deities, patrons, a uh, circle of archmages, a uh, council of druids, a really pissed off slod with a mallet. Like anything could cause an artifact to happen. Deaths, maybe an epic level battle. Yeah. A goat named Marmuk? Sure, yeah. And finally, for storytelling purposes, an artifact can be major or minor. What do we mean by that? Not every artifact is an orbital laser. (laughs) Although, interestingly (laughs) enough, one of our artifacts is for tonight. Yeah. But uh, that doesn't mean that a minor artifact is not deadly or it's less important than a major one. It just means that it operates on a more localized scope than Mm -hmm. the major ones. So the minors don't necessarily mean that they're less deadly. They just have maybe minor story potential. Yeah. So, And there might be more than one minor artifacts. A deck of many things has a very powerful but very localized set of abilities. Yes. The Ring of Winter from uh, the Forgotten Realms can bring about a global ice age. Those two things are not on the same scale. (laughs) One of these things is not (laughs) like the other. Yeah. So think about the scope when you're thinking about your artifact. If you want it to have maybe like up to 10 or even, you could even have more if you wanted, but if you want a couple or you want them to be maybe less of a focus because your play level is a bit less epic than normal, throw some minor artifacts in there. If you want something truly epic that is sure to get your party killed, throw Ring in a major. Winter. Yeah. Ring of Winter. <laughs> Ring of Winter will do it every time. All, I, all of ours are mostly minor. I don't know. One of mine has the option of becoming major the more time it's under control. And I've got one that is a major and a minor artifact mm, set. True. I, I kind of gave some some differences. Speaking of which, we've got some artifacts for you now to use in your campaign. Now, we, these are, in general, non-specific, but most of them are D&D flavored. But you have one that is strictly cyberpunk flavored. Yes. And I love it. Yeah. We've got six artifacts. So what do we got up first, Matt? 
Well, I think before we get to the artifacts, it's probably about that time. All right. So we're going to interject a little bit of artifacts for you in just a moment. You with the face. Do you like what we have to say? Help our channel rise from the depths like the mighty Godzilla. Please like and subscribe and ring the bell and do all of the necessary YouTube. What he said. If there are any topics you would like us to cover, goods or services you would like us to review, or if you would like to sponsor an episode, we would love for you to contact us at info at goblinscorner.com. And we're back. Welcome back. So we're talking artifacts, and we've given you guys some examples of how to make one, using them in your stories, and now we're going to get to the meat of this whole podcast, which is us throwing out random artifact random ideas. Random artifacts to piss off your players with. So what have we got first, Matt? I think the first one is yours, actually. Ah, uh, yes. So we have here the Firefly Jar of Arak Cesar. Again, we're trying to go generic because some people play 5th edition, some play 3.5, some play Pathfinder. You might play anything. And so for the most part, again, it's going to be more D&D heavy, but you could adapt this however you see fit. The All descriptions right. and the properties are... Fairly easy to, yeah. to use, but if you get to like the specific abilities, change them as you feel like. Yep. So tell me about a firefly jar. Okay. This simple mason jar with golden fireflies contains a monumental history, the legend of the first sun cleric of the drow. Her fate now scrubbed from any history book the drow have, Arak Cesar was also one of the first mystics to combine arcane and clerical magic, a la... Mystic Theurge, if you're playing 3.5. Sure. A brilliant student of the academies, Arak rebelled against the evil teachings of the dark goddess Loth, or Loth, or however you pronounce it in whatever game you're playing, and became a priest of an ancient and since deceased sun god of the drow. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. In, uh, so she was in a battle against an enemy priestess. She was struck permanently blind by acid, but she managed to escape. Stumbling into a grove in the Underdark, she suddenly found she could see by the light of several strange golden fireflies. She put them in a jar and for many years used that jar to light the way to other drow and other evil, quote-unquote, sure. natured creatures. So basically she's lighting the way for people who are trying to redeem themselves. Right. Upon her death, the jar disappeared, but often shows up in the hands of those who most need its guiding light. Very cool. Yeah. And a very artifact kind of, of way yeah yeah absolutely so we got properties yeah we got two minor and one major for beneficial okay and then two minor detrimental powers okay it's a little balanced on on, a, on the nicer side but you'll see why additionally there's a following major detrimental property which is actually a, a bad one you are hated by all followers of loth now granted anyone who's not a follower of loth <laughs> generally is hated anyway but it gets a little bit worse they're instantly aware of your allegiance to the sun god mm. and are tempted to attack on sight. All diplomacy checks fail. Sure. So basically, they are they absolutely 100% want to kill you yeah. all the time, every time. If you are in their sight, you are on their radar. Pretty much, yeah. Gotcha. They will attack you in favor of everything else, including backstabbing themselves. They do that a lot. Sure. So, what are the abilities for this thing? Well, we've got at will guidance, okay. you're lighting the way to people. Sure. See invisibility, dark vision, detect evil and good. Those make sense. So detection abilities, basically. Anything that you want to throw in your game can always change as well. Once per day, true seeing, foresight, find the path. True sight because you can see. So, once a day, you can see that. Once per day, you can have foresight, which is very powerful. Sure. Or find the path because you're lost and you want to, you know, it's, again, it's a guiding light. And then once per week, cure blindness. Makes sense. After cure blindness, on command, it can shed light in a 30-foot radius, a bright light. Okay. And then a dim light an additional 30 feet. Makes sense. Uh, the Firefly Jar of Arak Cesar dispels any darkness of up to 5th level automatically, which is cool. Sure. Additionally, it allows the user to attempt to dispel any darkness spell of 6th level and higher, just as Dispel Magic does. Okay. This higher function is usable once every short rest. Or if you don't use short rests, make, you know, a couple times a day. Sure. 
Uh, any creature of evil alignment which touches the Firefly Jar of Aroxazar immediately takes 3d10 points of damage, no save each round, because it's burning you. And the, the jar will not allow itself to be levitated, telekinesis, or moved except by touching it. So this keeps people from really destroying it. Right. Because you have to pick the damn thing up. Sure. And if you pick it up, you get burned. And if you're the kind of person that wants to destroy it, then you're probably not the kind of person that can use the jar. It's true. <laughs> so how would you destroy the jar, though? The jar of Arak Cesar f- must first be dipped into the ichor of a shadow dragon, which will allow the jar to open the fireflies. These must then be caught and drained of all life by a creature of shadow or a servant of Loth. So what is it? Their handmaidens, the yokels, or whatever yep. they're called. Once drained of all life and light, the glass in the bodies can be destroyed, although there's always a 10% chance that one of the fireflies escapes and recreates the jar whole. Nice. Because there's always hope in, in the darkness. Sure. So that's the firefly jar of Arak Cesar. Yours and mine. Now, keep in mind, there are times generally when we're doing things where uh, custom monsters and stuff like that, we create those separately in our own little vacuums. And you've come up with almost the same type of object which sheds light. Yes, and dispels darkness. Yep, which I find amusing. So what do we have for you, which is your light-shedding artifact? So my light-shedding artifact is the first torch. Okay, we've talked about this a couple of times on, on our show, so and you've finally written this up. Yeah, well, you know, I used it as an example of some ideas, and I was like, okay, well, if I'm going to keep using it as an, as an example, I should use it as an example. Yeah, so tell me about the first torch. The first torch was imbued by a shattered lightning bolt thrown by a young and almost entirely forgotten sky god from the earliest of humankind's pantheons. Now, we have a, a Neanderthal or, you know, uh, Stone Age type person here, right? This was Gog. Gog was a bit more curious than most of their pragmatic kin, so when a sudden storm blew in, they went into the heart of the storm to discover who or what was responsible. Sure, like you do. Yeah. In the sky, they saw this young deity lashing out with bolts of lightning. Lightning. You went went country on that, man. Okay, yeah. Sure, why not? And, uh, And raising the storm to greater violence. Just, you know. Sky God stuff. That's what they do. So Gog cursed the god and demanded that they stop. He was curious, but wise, maybe, maybe not so much. The god reached back and threw a bolt straight for our daring idiot ancestor, who saw the wind up and uh, hid behind a large ironwood tree. The tree shattered, as did the lightning bolt. Gog stole a brand from the tree that was still burning with a trapped shard of the Sky God's lightning bolts and brought it to his people. Gog's recklessness that day changed the course of human history. The first torch is an ironwood branch flaming on one end with a fierce, bright yellow flame. I love how that was created is that he pissed off a Sky God and that is the first torch which changed human history. Yep. Very cool. What are some properties that the first torch has? Well, first off, uh, it can't be extinguished. It will burn. It burns underwater, burns regardless. Yeah. There is a chunk of lightning bolt in it, right? It's not going out. Yep. So uh, it sheds bright light in a 30-foot radius and dim light in a 30-foot radius. Makes sense, yeah. Just like the, uh, the, the Firefly Lantern. Yep. It does require attunement if you're playing a system that has that. Sure. It is a plus two club Mm -hmm. that does 1d4 bludgeoning damage, 1d4 flaming damage, 1d4 lightning damage, and 1d4 radiant damage. All of which seems appropriate. Lightning, light, fire, and stick. (laughs) Yeah. I'm down with that. It grants you the ability to know and cast summon bonfire, Mm -hmm. right? Because you brought bonfire to the people or you brought fire to the people. Light, obviously, and guidance. And guidance 
primarily because this was where humankind's ability to start moving forward comes from. It starts each day with 15 charges that reset at dawn. Okay. You can use those charges to cast Bless for two charges. You can remove any darkness and fear effect within the light's radius sure. for four charges. Yeah, that makes sense. Fairy Fire for two charges. Okay. Flaming Sphere for three. Mm-hmm. And Daylight for five. There you go. All kinds of light-based, fire-based abilities. It does have a legendary effect. Okay. And I would consider this to be a curse. Yes, because it desperately depends on who the person holding the torch is. All right, so tell me about this legendary effect. The owner's actions begin to steer the course of humanity, specifically humanity, in slight ways for a mile radius per day of attunement. So, the longer that you hold this thing, the more chance you have to steer human history. Yes, because the radius just keeps getting larger and larger. Yeah, so you're definitely going to be a target for everybody that finds out you have this thing. 100%. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're you're in grave danger. (laughs) Awesome. How do you destroy this thing? It can only be destroyed by finding the sky god that threw the original lightning bolt. And I'm just going to call it a lightning bolt. I don't know why I'm stuck on it. And willingly surrendering it to them. The repercussions of that are unknown. You might turn back into an ape. Who knows what could happen then? Exactly. I love it. So first torch, guys. Very cool. I think it seems like fun. Yeah. So next for you, we've got the Spell Lens. Now, this is something that has been in my game for many, many games Mm -hmm. over the years, over the decades, I would say. Yeah. And I've never really explained what these things are. In fact, the first time they showed up was in a Spelljammer campaign. Right. And you guys royally got your ship destroyed. And then you guys stole one and used them to carve X's on planets, if you recall. So a Spell Lens is uh, this artifact that I've created. And there's major and minor, and I'll get to that in a second. Sure. Spell lenses are powerful creations from a strange race beyond the stars. Pick and choose what works best, right? Neoji, Arcane, something crazier. Who knows? It's Man, it's a great old one that threw those things out in the space just for the chaos of it all. It's the great old one's contact lens. That's what they are. When you see them, you'll, you'll get what I'm saying. Sure. There are two types, major and minor, and both share the same common theme. They resemble large, convex glass lenses, slightly colored purple. Sure. Minor spell lenses are about the size of a human's hand, while majors are four feet in diameter. So they're hefty pieces of glass. Sure. Whatever the type, spell lenses were created specifically to magnify and enhance the abilities of spells, powers, or any mystical energy tossed through the lens. So it's a magnifying glass. So you want to burn some ants? Imagine casting a fireball through that and sure. burning somebody even worse. All right, so we've, we've got a giant magical magnifying glass. I'm, I'm going with the old one's contact lens now because I just, I, that just works for me even better. We've got some properties, right? So right. you can do a, a minor beneficial and detrimental effect. For the minor lens. Right, and right. then a minor and a major beneficial and detrimental effect for the major spell lens. Gotcha. Uh, in addition to that, we have some abilities. So the miners magnify any ranged energy attack spell of 4th level and below. That ain't to trifle with. Sure. And that's going to be dependent on your system, whatever, right? Like maybe it doubles, maybe it triples, who knows? Yeah, and and you can play around with the levels if you want, if if you have a different game. Uh, Clairvoyance once per day. That's another thing that the miners have. Now, majors do that and... Magnify any ranged energy attack spell up to ninth level. Okay. That's I'm thinking horrifying. disintegrate. Yes. In addition to that, they can do clairvoyance and scrying once per day because it's a magnifying lens. Yeah. Some examples of how the spell might be magnified could include stuff like, I don't know, you could if you're playing D&D, you could have it maximized or empowered depending upon the system, widen, reach. Maybe you could have a distant spell, right? Sure. You could enlarge it or heighten it. So bigger, wider, better, faster, stronger, that sort of thing. Sure. You wouldn't quicken it. You wouldn't do anything like 
you know, the duration get any longer. Because really, it just beefs up the damage or the distance. Now, see, you went with disintegrate, and I can get that. I can get behind that. Mm -hmm. But me. What, flaming sphere or a searing ray? No, no, no. 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 Uh, what is it, polar ray? Minute meteors oh yeah no no it's just meteors jack we're just mm -hmm. chucking whole yeah, actual ass they're no meteors longer now. minute anymore my friend let me tell you that's all that's a good idea yeah i like that so how do you get rid of these things well as creations from beyond the stars spell lenses can only be destroyed in the heat of a star that makes sense where legends say the glass was forged okay, although I think Although you, you could give it back to the old one who it belongs to. Yeah, then he would he would thank you for delivering his contact lenses. Old back. ones are known for that, for thanking people. Hey, man, do you know how hard it is to find a contact lens when you drop it on the floor? Now imagine dropping it into space. Okay. So what you're saying is by thank, he's not going to eat you. He might. Or she. He, you might get some extra tentacles out of this equation. I, a col little column A, little column B might I, be good, might be bad, right? I'm just saying... <laughs> there are days where extra tentacles could be super useful. Oh, man. I could play the piano. All right. So, so that's a spell lens, At the guys. very least, chopsticks. Chopsticks, yeah. <laughs> Sushi. All right. Now, you have a, an amusing artifact next up, and it's called the Ghost Deck. Absolutely. Tell me about the Ghost Deck. Now, this is, this is cyberpunk. Yes. So tell me about this. All right. So... The legends of the ghost in the machine are well known. They've been documented for the longest time. The very concept of it has been around since before there was a matrix or uh, a system that you could actually jack directly into. Yeah. So, somebody succeeded. In making a ghost deck. Yes. So the whole premise of this is out there somewhere is a contraption that allows you to become the ghost in the machine. It exists in the physical world. You have to somehow track it down, get there, mm -hmm. and then if you choose, now understand, becoming the ghost in the machine entails becoming the ghost dot, <laughs> dot, dot, in the machine. If you jack in, you've jacked out a reality. Yeah, you're you're done there. Okay. And so uh, there's not a whole lot of necessary mechanical flavor here. It does what's on the tin. <laughs> right? So what I... You plug your data jack in, you're dead. You've effectively transferred... Your consciousness is transferred. You're like, uh, what is it? Um, you're lawn you go lawnmower man. Yep. And you're just... You become the ghost in the machine, right? It's and not, not known kung fu. It's like kung fu is bye bye because I am. Yeah, that re kung fu requires a body. Yeah, I am now Linux foo or something. Yeah, equally of penguin foo. Um, there you go. But yeah, so you enter into whatever the cyber, whether it's the Matrix or what have you, right? You enter in with where all of your mental traits mm -hmm. and all of your skills now also are mirrored to your physical traits. Interesting. How do you destroy this thing? Oh, it's easy to destroy. You just break the You just, you bomb it, right? Smash it up. Now, here's the thing. When you arrive, the bodies are not on the chair. So something has been moving them, because otherwise there'd be, someone would eventually have found this thing, and you just have a corpse mm -hmm. that you have to kind of shove off. And my theory is the original ghost in the machine has drones in the lair that don't activate. You're allowed to ghost yourself, it's fine. But if you destroy the lair, the drones leave and slowly begin to collect the stuff necessary to build another, to ghost. Build another ghost deck. I love that. So the only way to destroy that would be to destroy the original AI that made the ghost deck. Yep. Cool. <laughs> love it. Flavorful. Awesome. Yep. All right. So you, you have, in another uh, tangential brain wave that we managed together, <laughs> you also have made a club. Yes, I have. A blunt instrument of destruction called Mind Your Manners. Okay. Now, 
this is under my theory that all ex adventurers either become despots, they rule some some kind of country, sure. or they become bartenders. Sure. Because that's what adventurers end up doing, right? They usually If you've got the money for it, why not buy a bar and pay someone to run it? Absolutely. This nondescript wooden club would be right at home at any tavern, inn, or bar. While well worn, it is of excellent craftsmanship and strength, and upon picking up the club, the welder is surprised at the weight and heft. It's weighty. It's got some meat to it. Yeah. Those with a keen eye note an array of fingerprints of all types and all species, I might add, across the handle of the weapon as if melded into the wood. No amount of cleaning removes them. Like they're literally an embossing at this point. Right. Legend has it that in the early days of the world, before the gods lorded over all, the only safe places for common folk to gather were the local taverns. Sure. Some would say that still the way it is today. Adventurers, after surviving countless battles and acquiring massive amounts of treasure, either became kings or bartenders. Sometimes both. That's where bartenders come from. That's exactly right. They are kings of their lair. One such barkeep whose name is lost to history was a famous warrior of impeccable manners and an exquisite taste for beer. Now you see where the mind your manners comes from? Sure. Never standing for bar fights, he would remind those to mind their manners first verbally, then physically. Like the you club, do. With yeah. the club. Uh, because of this, his club started to pick up the effervescence of his personality, shall we say. His club now carries his story to other adventurers in the hopes that they, too, will retire someday to continue the tradition of drinking and fighting. That's that's Mind Your Manners. Yep. That throws Bucko Nine lyrics in my head, but it's <laughs> fine. Uh, I was thinking Black Shirt. Oh, okay. Don't show no blood. All right. Uh, so property-wise, got two minors okay. and two majors, both beneficial and detrimental, whatever you want to choose. Right. I would say something drinking or club-related. Sure. Maybe barkeep related. That'd be kind of fun. Additionally, the first time a new owner attunes Mind Your Manners, their fingerprints from the hand they hold the weapon are permanently removed from that appendage and bound forever to the club. There is no way short of destroying the club to get your fingerprints back. So if you're left-handed or right-handed, whatever, or you, you know, whatever you weld that club with when you attune first time, you lose the fingerprints on that hand. Nice. Done flavorful yeah every rogue wants it every rogue well they they want to attune twice to it at that point if you are under oh there's a curse by the way sure because why not if you're under 15th level you are cursed with wanderlust and can never remain in a location for more than one week i get that what if to just as a flavor option you can accidentally break the curse by purchasing a tavern and choosing to retire. I'd be fine with that. Like sure. If you, amass the, if you amass the necessary thing, that's what... If you're able to own a tavern before 15th level, I would say it breaks the curse. But I would say then it is lost to someone else because it only wants epic bartenders to weld it. Sure. <laughs> Look at this pansy. He doesn't know how to bartend this, yet. This He's only can't... been... He's only been to 500 bars. He can't even mix a proper drink, and he hasn't slayed a dragon yet. You call that a Cosmo. Yeah, c- come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what abilities does this thing have? So first off, it's a mace. So I'm thinking plus three mace of disruption, mm-hmm. which always, always, it's a, always good, always flavorful. Additionally, if damaged by mind your manners, the target must succeed on a DC 15 strength check or fall prone. Because when you get hit, you stay down. Good old thug and stick. I'm Good old it. thug and stick. If you use the mace to break up or end a fight, you can deal an extra 2d6 bludgeoning damage to the target. Makes sense. Right? If you start the fight, you take 1d6 psychic damage. If somebody else starts the fight, isn't it always attempting to end a fight when you have a mace? It is, yeah, but someone might go, I'm going to end the fight that's going on. If it's a disagreement, it's not like actually a fight. It has to be a bar fight. Right. Okay, specifically a bar fight. Now, okay. combat's a different story. Because <laughs> that's where I was going. No. Like the second you pop into combat, boom, 2d6 with every swing. I got sure. it. Sure. Well, that's not a bar fight. Right. I mean, now, if 
you happen to get that dragon to the bar, then it becomes a bar fight. Sure. <laughs> Additionally, you get immunity to poison damage. I mean, sure. You Why gotta not? be able to drink. Proficiency with brewing. And of course, the mace. You get proficient in a weapon. And if you're over fifth level, once per day, you can cure your wounds and remove poison. Sure. And, and obviously, you're immune to poison, but you remove poison on somebody else. And I would say that cure wounds should either scale or, you know, up yeah. to the DM's call. Yeah, it could be third level or fifth level, whatever the level it has to be. Right. And I think the remove poison is flavorful because when you throw somebody out of a bar because they've been too drunk, you remove their poison. Now they're sober. Yeah. So all that so, time has gone to waste for them. And that's what you get for starting a bar fight. Absolutely. Unless you're in a bar where a bar fight's expected. Yes. Now, if you're over 10th level, all damage is force instead of blunt. That's brutal. That's, well, yeah. I mean, it, you got to mind your manners, man. How do you get rid of this thing? So, mind your manners can only be destroyed by first hunting down every previous owner and restoring their fingerprints. Okay. That could be problematic. Could be five or ten of these on there. Could be a hundred. It's especially problematic if it's if this artifact is very old. Yes. Because many of those people are going to be dead. Well, you know, gonna have to go to the plains. It's an artifact. It's That's powerful. True. That's fair. And then the mace must be immersed in the urine of a baylor for nine years until the wood is soft enough to destroy. I mean, obviously. <laughs> Baylor's Soggy got a wood. Got a, Baylor's got a pee on it. Got to stick it in a barrel, age it for nine years, like a fine whiskey. So there you have it. That is the Mind Your Manners Club. Now, we've got one more left, and I, I, I'm glad you saved this for last because I can't wait to hear about the Mirrored Mask of Mischief. You know how I love alliteration. I know. I'm here to help. I'm a helper. When discovered, the Mirrored Mask of Mischief appears exactly as you might expect, a silvery reflective half-mask. After donning the mask and wearing it for a certain length of time, or attunement or as appropriate to your game, sleep with it, right. polish it, whatever the hell it is, it becomes invisible and intangible to anyone but the owner who can remove it at will. Except? Except they have to manage to break the curse that prevents them from wanting to not remove it. So I have this mirrored mask that can go invisible and intangible. Yes. Okay. So far, so good. It's like a fairy mask. Turns out, <laughs> it is said that the mirrored mask was made by an archfey with an urge to sow chaos for the amusement of it. That's right on point with your thinking so far. <laughs> cool. What kind of properties does this thing have? Unlimited disguise self. As appropriate. Right. That's necessary. Plus one to AC. Yeah, it's a mask. Yeah. Protects your face. Yeah. Or at least half of it. Makes you immune to charm and fear. Fairy magic. Also appropriate. Part of my reasoning behind that was this arch fey didn't want other fey to be able to use you. That's pretty cool. I like that. <laughs> this is chaos for chaos's sake. You can't steer it. Yeah. So, if you're polymorphed, you maintain your mental stats. Also useful. Yes. It grants you the prestidigitation, thaumaturgy, and druid craft cantrips. So you're always clean or colored or doing something ridiculous. Right. None of those deal damage, but they can all be used for all manner of nonsense. You say they don't deal damage, but I would... They have the ability to allow you to do things that cause damage, but they don't individually deal damage. Oh, I would I would wreck that with those three. Sure. If somebody standing near a door or a window used thaumaturgy to slam it open, mm -hmm. I would say that hurts, but that's just me. It starts off with 15 charges. Okay. You can use one charge for fairy fire, two for alter self. Okay. You know, so that you can get water breathing, what have you. Yeah. Two for charm person. Three for pass without trace, so you can do the sneaky sneaky. Yeah. Four for blink. And six charges get you polymorph. However, you can't polymorph yourself. Oh, that doesn't stop me. That's great. So how do you destroy this thing? That's the thing about destroying this thing, right? Is 
Now, I wouldn't destroy this thing because I think this is perfect for shenanigans. Absolutely. In fact, the shenanigan mask is another good name for this thing. You have to take it to a place that knows no joy and can know no joy for however long you feel is thematically appropriate as the GM. The thing about that is if you're a person that's delivering it, you're a creature most likely that is capable of feeling joy. Unless you end up having to be drained of all joy. Correct. Which would suck. Yes. Okay. So far so good with that. But it has a kind of curse. We already know that it's not removable unless you get rid of that curse, but it has another kind of curse. Okay. Now remember, this thing is built to sow chaos. Every day that all of the charges are not spent increases the chance that the mask lashes out the next time the wearer is in an area that includes 15 or more people. The mask will, at random, Use all of the charges at random targets Ooh. in any crowd larger than 15 people. The targets, the spells, and the effects are all chosen for maximum chaos. So at any point in time, if you don't blast 15 charges, it's going to just create chaos for you. It's a, it's a cumulative effect, right? The first day it might not happen. Second day it's more likely to happen. And third day, it's even more likely to happen. So you better blow a lot of fairy fires every day or a couple of polymorphs or something. Now, the thing about that is that curse does not show up under an identify. So you don't know. Oh, so you have to find that, that out you the need to do that. Wonderful. Yep. Love that. Well, that definitely sows some chaos there. Yep. And that was the idea. <laughs> so there you have it. A couple of artifacts that we've given for you to use in your campaign, whatever the campaign could be cyberpunk, could be D&D, could be something else. Sure. And of course, some ways to create artifacts as well. Give you guys a little inspiration going on this. Absolutely. Did we miss something? Write to us. Info at goblinscorner.com or you can reach me, eric at goblinscorner.com or me, matt at goblinscorner.com. We're on all the things. Matt, what are some of these things that we happen to be on? We happen to be on Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, YouTube, and Twitch. As Goblins Corner. And Instagram. As the goblin's corner true facts did you like our show subscribe to our podcast on your favorite player youtube and twitch make sure you click the five stars and give us a review on itunes spotify Podchaser, and youtube it boosts the show and it feeds the ever hungry algorithm if you don't feed the hungry algorithm you may have to mind your manners thud <laughs> <laughs> that's all the time we have for tonight once again my name's eric and i'm matt we'll see you next time good night folks The Goblin's Corner is written and produced by Eric Holden and Matt Staples. Show song by the Mighty D20. What a wonderful guy. This is a subterranean production. The end.